thank you to our choir for the ministry of music, Faith for playing while Ed is in Peru. Uh, had uh, someone slip me a note and a couple of other announcements we missed during the opening time. We wanted to extend also a special thank you today to those who helped with the World Changers event, making meals uh, every day and uh, delivering meals, those who worked in the kitchen. You put a lot of work in, and we do appreciate it. And uh, I'm told that, again, you know, I don't make a promise to announce them all, but the ones I'm told, today is James Gibbs's birthday and Serena Sutherland's birthday. Serena, Serena, you want to stand up so we can recognize you? Yay, let's... <laughs> and also... And also Maggie Lafere, and I don't believe Maggie's here, but I want to wish, wish you all a very happy and blessed birthday. I was uh, watching TV this week, just kind of flipping through the channels, uh, really, you know, just trying to find something to watch. And, and I normally don't land on public television for too long, usually kind of skip on to something else. But there was something really interesting. It was a uh, biography, or documentary actually, on Henry Ford, the creator of Ford uh, Motors and... Um, Ford, who uh, had done things like he brought the assembly line technique to the automotive industry. He had gotten that from the meatpacking industry. But it was a really fascinating um, uh, documentary on his life. And, of course, you know his signature automobile was what? No, no, the, the, the type of car. The Model T, the Model T. Now, someone who said black before. So, someone said black. That, that's where I was going next. You peeking at my notes, Susie? There. Ford, of course, he got the Model T and he perfected the assembly line technique. He made it so that the average working person could afford a car. And he said that you can have any color you want as long as the color is black. And so it was really interesting. He did really well. But what was fascinated me was that as the rest of the industry developed and caught up to Ford, um, the Model T started becoming very antiquated very quickly. General Motors, other companies started coming out with new cars, new designs, and new colors. And Ford was very resistant to change, to, to, to adopt new models and new colors. Eventually he did with his son's urging, but it took a while for him to realize that the Model T had kind of gone out of vogue because he loved that car. And it got me thinking about other things that go out of fashion, out of vogue. You know, not only automobiles, uh, you know, they change over time. Uh, clothing changes. I mean, if you know, if you're old enough, like me, just go back in your photo albums and look at what you were wearing in the 60s and 70s. Okay, that plaid leisure suit, uh-uh, and ain't working today. Fashions go out of style. Hairdos go out of style. Words go out of style. You know, um, very few people use the word groovy anymore. And that was a, we had a groovy time. I mean. If you're a parent of a teen, ask them that and, and see what they react, how they react. Um, other words that go out of vogue or change, the word rap. Now, if, 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 you're, if you're like around my age, when you were a teenager, to rap meant what? To talk. Hey, we're going to go rap. Then I've got some bread so we can go out and get something to eat, right? Yeah, I mean, just whole different things. But to rap today means something else. Words go out of vogue. They change. And a word that really has kind of gone out of fashion, but one we need to really focus on, that we hope to focus on today, is the word repentance. This, this word has been rolling around in my mind for quite some time, uh, some ways to think about this, because it's really a word we don't talk about anymore. And today's message is really focusing on this one single word. What does it mean to repent? What does repentance really mean? Because it's a, it's a crucial word in the scriptures. I want to invite you to turn with me to uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. Um, this is immediately following after Jesus had been tempted in the desert. He is in the Judean area, and John the Baptist has been recently arrested, put in prison, and that's sort of the mark for Jesus' public ministry to begin. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. Scripture says, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which is by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to, fill, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. 
a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for your holy word, the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts would be pure and acceptable in your sight. Our Lord and our rock and our redeemer. Jesus' holy name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. You know, it, it happens every year, every year without fail. Charlie Brown's out in a field practicing his place kicking, and Lucy offers to hold the football for Charlie Brown to kick. But every year it's the same. Charlie Brown approaches the ball with all his might, ready to kick it out of the end zone, but Lucy yanks the ball away at the last second, leaving Charlie Brown flying helplessly through the air and landing flat on his back. Well, in one strip, Lucy offers to hold the football for Charlie Brown again, but this time, well, good old Charlie Brown isn't having any of it. You see, he's been fooled too many times before. So Lucy begs him, she, she pleads with him to give it another try. But Charlie Brown won't budge. Every time I try and kick the football, you remove it, and I fall on my back, he says. Well, eventually Lucy breaks down in tears and says, Charlie Brown, I have been so terrible to you over the years, picking the football up like I have. I've played so many cruel tricks on you. But I've seen the error of my ways. I've seen the hurt look in your eyes when I've deceived you. I've been wrong, so wrong. Won't you please give a poor penitent girl another chance? Well, moved by Lucy's tears and her apparent sincerity, Charlie Brown says, of course I'll give you another chance. So Lucy holds the ball And he steps back to get a running start. And as Charlie Brown comes barreling in, Lucy once again pulls the ball away at the last second. And once again, Charlie Brown swings and misses and ends up falling flat on his back. And as he lies there looking up at the sky, not believing he fell for it again, Lucy bends over and says to him, recognizing your faults and actually changing your ways are two different things, Charlie Brown. (laughs) Well, Lucy's right, isn't she? Recognizing your faults and actually changing your ways are two different things. And simply feeling bad about something and actually repenting of it requires more than just words. It, It really requires a complete change of heart. Now, you know, repentance, as I said before, repentance is one of those words we really don't use a lot anymore. It's a word that's like the Model T gone out of vogue, which is really surprising considering how often it turns up in Scripture. You know, although it appears almost five dozen times in the New Testament alone, we rarely talk about repentance. We, We don't teach much on it. In fact, we tend to skip over it altogether, preferring to focus what we think is on the more positive aspects of the faith. So so telling folks that God loves them, for example, no matter how badly they've messed up, telling folks God loves them, it usually gets the preacher a lot of accolades in the receiving line after church. But telling them they have to repent of their sins and change their ways, well, you know, that leads to a lot of squirming in the pews and, and looking at watches during the sermon. It may even lead to less in the offering plate. I don't know. But I love what Cornelius Plantica of Calvin College says about coming to grips with sin and repentance in our lives, he says, the awareness of sin used to be our shadow. Christians hated sin. They feared it. They fled from it. They grieved over it. In today's group confessionals, he says, it's harder to tell. Instead of focusing on sin and repentance, Plantica says, he says, the newer language says, let us confess our problem with human relational adjustment dynamics and especially our feebleness in networking. He says, or I'd love to just share that we need to target holiness as a growth area. Where sin is concerned, Plantica adds, 
Where sin is concerned, people just mumble now. And yet, repentance is at the heart of Jesus' teaching. In fact, you know, it's the very first thing he taught. And you know, really have to let that sink in for a moment. The very first thing Jesus told people to do was to repent. He didn't talk about grace or mercy or the inexhaustible love of God, themes that would, of course, come later in his teaching. The first thing Jesus talked about was the need to repent for the kingdom of God is near, and that's significant. You know, when I preached my first sermon here, I chose what I wanted to say very carefully. I I wanted to proclaim the gospel faithfully, of course. That's every preacher's goal. But, you know, I, I didn't think it would hurt if I threw in a few jokes and, uh, and a couple of poignant insights to impress you with how witty and erudite I was. Uh, now, of course, you know better. And, you know, I suspect it will be the same, a lot the same for Joshua and Amy in a few weeks when they begin preaching to the church in San Marcos. They're going to choose their words very carefully because they want to draw people in. They, they want to start developing a relationship with that congregation so that church can really receive what they have to say. It's no secret. It's how we all do it. We, 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 we play it safe at first. But Jesus cuts right to the chase with this immediate call to repentance, a command he makes repeatedly throughout the Gospels. And what's striking is how stark and simple and direct his message really is. Essentially, he's saying, he's saying, you've been heading in the wrong direction. God's kingdom is here. Turn around now before it's too late. It's pretty straightforward. It's even confrontational. I mean, let's face it. There's nothing more confrontational than someone commanding you to do an about face. Because technically, this is what the word repent really means. It means to do an about face. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, could you imagine, say, being in the army and having a drill sergeant bark out an order to do an about face? And then you casually strolling up to that sergeant, putting your arm around his shoulder and suggesting the two of you sit down so you can discuss together how that command makes you feel. Can you imagine that? That sergeant's boot would become a permanent part of your posterior. Why? Because it's not a suggestion. It's a command. And we have to understand what Jesus is saying here the same way. This call to repentance, it it isn't just a suggestion. and It's not just some friendly advice. It's a command to begin considering our lives in a whole new way. And, and, And here's where it really gets tricky. Because you know what we think about repentance and what Jesus means are usually two different things. See, we often think of repentance as feeling remorse, you know, uh, being sorry about something. And and sorry is good. Sorry is a good place to start, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't end there. In fact, sorry is only the beginning. Without going any further, we've really made no progress at all if all we are is sorry. For example, last week, I think it was last week now, I'd, I'd planned on running in the West Virginia 5K here in town. It's part of the race series our church sponsors, and I've been looking forward to it. But the week before that, I had kind of strained my hamstring playing church softball. So I laid off of it, resting it, hoping a week would heal it up. And the morning of the race that morning, got up at 5.15. Got up, ate breakfast, took a hot bath to loosen it up. And I got down on my family room floor, was stretching it. Real good stretch. Got downtown half an hour before the race. Got my race bib on and I was warming up. But you know, it became pretty clear to me that I wasn't going to be able to do it. The leg was still hurting and there was no way I was going to be able to run, which was a disappointment. Now, you know, here's the thing. It, it didn't matter that I wanted to run or that I had the best intentions of running and had been training to run or even had a ra- arrived at the race on time. The fact is I got there I was really at the starting line, but I didn't actually run. And so you'll never, ever in that race find my name among the finishers, despite my best intentions. You see, repentance is is more than just feeling sorry about something. Repentance 
It's simply, uh, it's, it's like my aborted 5K attempt. It's, it's like stopping at the beginning before you even start. But true repentance goes further than that. I mean, you look at scriptures. In the end, Judas Iscariot, he felt badly about betraying Jesus. He, he really did. But simply feeling badly didn't help him. The scripture says this. So when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. And he returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and elders. Then he went away and hanged himself. So remorse isn't the same as repentance. Uh, we can feel badly about a lot of things without ever changing our ways. Just like Lucy did with Charlie Brown. It, it's got to go further than that. And you know, it's, just, it's not just about trying harder either. See, that's another common mistake we make, thinking repentance. If, if it's feeling sorry about something, it's also about just trying harder to do different. You know, I remember as a boy going to confession. I grew up Catholic in the Catholic Church. And I'll tell you what, I, I hated going to confession. If you grew up Catholic, maybe you feel the same way. I, I just hated it. Basically, you enter this dark little booth, and there was this little screen, this opaque screen, separating you from the priest. You got in there, they closed the curtain, and you began spilling your guts about all the bad things you, you ever did. It was embarrassing. I mean, it really was. That, that little screen was supposed to keep everything anonymous, but I didn't think it did. I think the priest knew exactly who was behind there. So, so you go into the booth and you, you tell all the priests your sins and then he'd absolve you and tell you to go out and say, for example, five Our Fathers and a couple of Hail Marys as your penance. And that was it. You were forgiven. And then when you sinned some more, you came back again and you said some more Our Fathers and some more Hail Marys and you kept repeating this cycle. More Our Fathers, more Hail Marys, depending, I guess, on how much you've sinned. The point, though, was, you know, really when you think about it, it was always about you. You doing more, saying more prayers, performing more penance that was supposed to set you free. But it never did. It reminds me of that great character uh, in George Orwell's uh, book, Animal Farm. Remember Boxer the horse? Anybody remember that? Boxer was this kind-hearted but, but dull-witted workhorse, and he, he unknowingly supports the pigs in their takeover of the farm. And Boxer believes that any problem, any problem in the world, can be resolved if only he works harder. That's what he always says. That's his signature line in the book. I will work harder. And the pigs, of course, those evil pigs, they, they use this to their advantage, and eventually old Boxer works himself to death, and the pigs send him to the slaughterhouse in exchange for a case of whiskey. You see, equating repentance with just trying harder it assumes in the end that it's really just about self-improvement. That with just a little bit of work, we can be the man or woman we're supposed to be. Well, let me tell you, repentance isn't about self-improvement. Repentance is about self-surrender. C.S. Lewis says this, he says, Fallen man, you and I, fallen man, he says, Fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement he is a rebel who must lay down his arms he says this process of surrender this movement full speed astern is what christians call repentance and then he adds now repentance is no fun at all it is something much harder than merely eating humble pie it means unlearning all of the self-conceit and self-will we have been training ourselves into for thousands of years it means killing part of yourself, undergoing a kind of death. Well, Lewis is right, of course, but I, I think it goes even a little further than that. You see, true repentance isn't just about dying to ourselves. It's also about becoming alive to God. Author Ben Patterson puts it this way. He says, if the negative deathly side of repentance is ending my love affair with myself. The positive side is learning to fall in love with God. And see, that's what repentance truly is. It's, it's a dying to ourselves, making a U-turn in our lives, for sure. But even more than that, it's the reorientation of our entire lives to God, what theologian Thomas Chalmers calls the expulsive power 
of a new affection. I want you to chew on that for a moment because that one phrase, I think that one phrase, Chalmers, he captures the essence of all repentance. It's the expulsive power of a new affection, the power of something else to expel what's less worthy in our lives. Think of it like this. Back, back when we lived in Pennsylvania, we, we had this little beagle dog named Trixie. And Trixie was about as doggiest a dog as you can ever know. And, and one day Faith came in the house and she told me this great story about how our neighbor's Amish pigs got loose and how Trixie darted after them in hot pursuit. Now, how can you tell they were Amish pigs? They were, you know, they had the little hats and the little beards on, but they were, um, but they really, we had Amish neighbors and they were the pigs. You know, they didn't really wear hats, okay? Um, but so the, the, the pigs got loose and Trixie chased them all over the place, and I was sorry to miss that. I, honestly, the town only had 400 people in it, so there wasn't a lot to do. And the thought of my little dog chasing all these Amish pigs, just, I, it just seemed funny to me. Well, sometime later, our neighbor's pigs got loose again, and Trixie took after them like before. But this time, though, I was out there, and I watched as she chased these pigs up this old dirt lane, uh, kind of wondering what her plan was when she finally caught them. But, you know, about three-quarters of the way up the lane, all this commotion apparently spooked a rabbit that had been hiding out underneath some bushes. And the rabbit, once he spooked, he got out and he bolted in the other direction. And in an instant, Trixie completely forgot about the pigs and started chasing after that rabbit. You see, and, and here's the point. In a sense, a new affection had entered Trixie's life. She was a beagle. And while chasing pigs was okay, man, chasing rabbits is what she was born to do. And so when an object more worthy of her attention presented itself, that object became Trixie's focus and her passion. Well, do you see what I'm getting at here? Uh, this is what true repentance is all about. It's not simply feeling remorse or working harder to become better people. It's about the power of a new affection, an affection that expels everything less worthy in our lives. See, our hearts... Our hearts are always going to center on something. The question is, what will that something be? You know, there's an old episode of Seinfeld, which I know Skip will appreciate, in which George Costanza, he decides that every decision he's ever made in life is wrong and that his life is the exact opposite of everything he's always wanted it to be. Anybody remember that episode? It's a great episode. So he shares this with Jerry over lunch. Every decision he's ever made is wrong. And Jerry tells him that if every instinct he's ever had has been wrong, then logically the opposite would have to be right. Well, George thinks about it and he realizes what Jerry is saying is true. So right then and there, he resolves to start doing the complete opposite of everything he'd normally do. So instead of ordering his normal lunch of tuna on toast, for example, he orders chicken salad on rye which causes Jerry to say that chicken salad and rye is the opposite of tuna on toast, but that's another story. But when a beautiful young woman who orders the exact same meal glances his way, George fights every instinct he has. And he goes over to her and he introduces himself. He doesn't lie about himself. He says, my name is George, I'm unemployed, and I live with my parents. And surprisingly, she immediately agrees to date him. Well, you know, there's, there's this way in which we think of repentance as just doing the opposite of what we'd normally do. But this isn't what Jesus means. You know, if, if just doing the opposite of what we'd normally do were all it took, it would simply be about exchanging one set of rules for another. And ultimately, well, ultimately salvation would be all up to us. But in order for real change to take place, there has to be a new affection, a new object for the heart to focus on. And so when Jesus begins his public ministry with his call to repentance, it's not just about turning away from what's bad. It's ultimately about learning to love what's good. Dr. Ray Pritchard of Keep Leaving Ministries says this. He says, until the heart is captured by some higher power, a higher calling, a fresh vision of God, 
There will be no motive for real change, he says. But when the love of God fills us from within, then we experience new desires and the expulsive power of a new affection becomes a reality for us. We see, this is what Jesus Christ came to bring. He came to bring a fresh vision of God. A vision that's so full of grace and goodness that everything else pales in comparison. And that the old affections which once ruled our lives are crowded out by our growing affection for Him. That's what it's about. It's not simply about feeling badly or trying hard to be a better person. It's just being filled more and more by Him. And when Jesus Christ fills our hearts and and when we begin to grasp the enormity of His love and sacrifice for us on the cross, all the other things that consume our lives are put in their proper place. And the kingdom of God begins becoming a reality within us. You know, in uh, Greek mythology, when the great hero Ulysses, when he sails past the island of the Sirens, he he plugs up his crew's ears with wax so they're unable to hear their song. And then Ulysses orders his crew to tie him to the ship's mast so he can't be seduced by the Sirens' song either. You see, these these Sirens, they're, they're these, these creatures, they sing such enchanted songs that no one can resist. Anyone hearing them, they, they immediately jump overboard and they try to swim to shore or they, they try to sheer, steer their ships ashore. But they're inevitably killed by the jagged rocks surrounding the island. So Ulysses' solution is to prevent his men from hearing anything and having him lashed to the mast so he won't jump overboard. But in another myth, a different one, the great musician Orpheus, is he's sailing past the same island with another crew. But instead of stopping up their ears with wax and having himself tied down, Orpheus, he pulls out his harp and he begins playing a beautiful song of his own, a song much more captivating than what the sirens sing. And Orpheus and his crew are able to sail by the dangerous island unharmed because their hearts and their minds are filled by a far more beautiful song. Well, the question I want to ask you today is, what song fills your heart right now? See, only a new song is sufficient to expel all the other voices clamoring for attention in our lives right now. It's only a song that has Jesus Christ at its center. You see, what Jesus wants is for you to embrace him, not out of guilt or part of a self-improvement program. Jesus wants you to know his love and the depth of God's love shown through his life and his death and his resurrection. Because when you truly grasp the love of God, when you truly grasp it, you can't help but loving God in return and discovering that repentance It isn't about not doing bad stuff. But it's really about the love of God made real. And how that love becomes the guiding influence over your entire life. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much. You took flesh and came, Lord, and lived this life we never could live. And Lord, you didn't just affirm us in our sin, Lord. But you called us to repent. You called us to turn around, Lord, and begin loving what's right, Lord, not just rejecting what's wrong, but loving what's right. You called us, Lord, to know your love. And Lord, by knowing your love, to love you in return. And so, Lord, help us to see repentance for what it truly is, Lord. Lord, a word that's not gone out of fashion, a word that's not negative in its connotation, Lord, a word that's positive, a word that's calling us, Lord, to a new song in our hearts and our lives, a song that has you at the center. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, for this expulsive power of a new affection, that love for you, Lord, would crowd out everything unworthy in our lives, 
and that the kingdom would be a reality within us. Lord Jesus, we ask this for ourselves, for this church. We ask your hand of blessing, Lord, on this church so we may be active in doing what you've called us to do. We pray for our members, Lord, for those who are home today, who are ill, who are hurting. Lord, for those who need your special touch of grace right now, hear us, Lord. Hear us as we pray the words that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, would you please rise as we sing together our hymn, Refiner's Fire. <laughs>